Hello gang! Welcome to Sketching with Izzy. We've got another rando episode today. I'm planning on doing just some random sketches. I need to do my usual uh, audio check. Let me know if you can hear me in the chat. It would be great. I think it's going to be portraits today. I'm taking a, another day off from Blood Flower. Just to do some studies, I figured. Might be something fun. I'm using uh, portrait draw portraits for drawing .tumblr as my ref site. I've used it before, it's pretty good. When I'm starting out my portraits, I like to just get rough shapes in. Nothing special. It's more about like placement, comparing, you know, the light and dark, the, the greater light, light and dark shapes and making sure that the overall shapes read. It's almost like doing it in a way it's like doing a caricature you want to just grab grab the the quick read the quick likeness you can get the read to work in the first five minutes or so you're doing good, I think. I like using a rough brush with a with a little bit of texture to get strokes in and then my smudge brush, my handy dandy smudge. It does most of the heavy lifting when it comes to edge control. It's the joy of doing digital. You gotta kinda decide whether or not you wanna do a beautifying or kind of an uglifying of your your model. And it's always fun to go either way, I think.
With your smudge, you can get away with a lot of... You can hide a lot of crimes. That's why I like counting on it so much, but... It's definitely a crutch. Even though I'm using reference, I like to flip. And that's just to check how the balance of everything feels completely outside of the reference. You know? Get a, get a feel for it almost as an illustration instead. We got nothing lighter here than 50% it looks like. It's a good tight value key to start with. Should be doing this probably with a bigger brush. Get those big strokes in. She might be even squintier than this. Not a happy woman, but that's all right. So much of your portraiture is going to happen in the 50% mid-tone range. So it's a really good idea to learn to master your value keys and get comfortable with working in a really tight uh, value range. I think that's one of the great things about practicing with portraits is that it forces you to really uh, Unify your values and get them to behave.
I'm kind of checking my time just to make sure I'm not spending too much on these. It's really just kind of a loosening up exercise, have some fun. Gotta get all those neck meats in there. It's all about the neck meats. Ciao. Yeah, I love using these brushes because it in the end, it'll feel like, it, it tends to feel like it's traditional, and I miss, I'll always miss doing traditional. I don't get that many opportunities to do it anymore, you know? We've blocked in all of the big shapes. It took about 12 minutes or so. So now it's just kind of trying to find the secondary shapes without, without rendering. Try to find the secondary shapes that we can illuminate with minimal brush strokes. We don't want to render, it's a sketch, right? Squinting at the source. Sort of an abuelita type of character. I met a lot of these ladies in Mexico. Very interesting folks. Get some of this cheek action in. Nice quickie warm up. All right, so now that we've got her there, what can we do? That's good enough for a sketch. Okay, let's do something silly now. I like to do things, I like to do a sketch and then kind of see if I can pull any ideas from what I just did. It's a fun way to do concept art. Let's 
particularly fond of the mouth and jowls. Grandma looks like she's tripping.
This might be usable for blood flower after all. Maybe this could be our abbess. I try not to do like really dark uh, pupils or irises if the surrounding like eyeball and things like that are really really light it, it tends to look really cartoony so if I'm gonna go really dark with the shadows of the eyes then the then the meat around it needs to follow suit which is gonna help keep the value key correct It's got kind of a Mickey Rooney thing going on here. <laughs> Got to get a lot of character in those eyes. It's easier said than done, though, I tell you. You got to communicate a lot with just a couple of lines and, and a couple of dots, you know? But if you just get the proportions right, your, your viewer is going to read a lot into it, you know? Even if you were to just kind of just whip together two, you know, three lines like that, your viewer is going to be able to, you know, extrapolate some kind of meaning from that. Like our brains are just designed to do that. So you can count on that to some degree, but for some reason, when you start rendering, it gets a little bit tougher to hold on to that abstraction. And you want, you want a little bit of that abstraction in it. Because it, the abstraction inherently creates an air of mystery. A, a desire to kind of look deeper. You know what I mean? I like the idea of this really, really tight hairline. And of course, because of the area we're working, the, the, the sort of um, 
the peoples that we're referencing. We want to, we want to, even, even with great age, you want to tie it in. So my reference didn't have any of this, any of this stuff that, that feels distinctly Mayan. And I want to try to bring that back. Hi, Chris Annam. How's it going? How do you feel about economy of line versus sketchy, loose, and expressive lines to convey meaning? Um, honestly, it's whatever whatever gets it done for you. You know, uh, what feels good. It's You should definitely learn both ways of doing that sort of thing. Um, it's worth understanding the the feel and the thought process behind both methods. Um, I like, I like a mix of both myself. Uh, calligraphic line equality or line quality and economy. And then, you know, every now and then it doesn't hurt to throw in some sketchies. I like the sketchies for texture. I like them for, you know, hatching, things like that. I don't use them so much for trying to find something. If you're doing this to find something and you're, and, and it's, it's going to slow you down and it looks, it specifically looks unsure. Like, like you're not, you're not con, uh, confident in your decisions. Um, the better lines will generally be the ones that that come across with a great deal of confidence it, it doesn't they don't need to be excuse me the, the accuracy is going to get that you're going to develop that feel that through the confidence that it is accurate even when it's not you know what i'm saying so uh commit commit and make boldly make the mistakes you'll be happy you did And the, the line economy, line confidence thing, it's very much a situation of, you know, fake it till you make it. You can just do it. Um, the, the important thing to remember is that nobody's going to see your reference, really. Nobody cares about that. They care about what you did. So they're not going to be... Maybe if the model's sitting right there and or the, your, your reference is sitting right there and then they're just kind of like looking back and forth between those two things. Yeah, of course, there's going to be some um, some breakdown from that. But usually when your work is done, no one's going to be looking at the at the origin. You want to show your interpretation and you should be confident in your interpretation. That makes sense. Yeah, no problem. Happy to help. So this character that I'm that I'm painting up definitely feels way more uh, stylized than Bloodflower, and e even the the last illustration that we did, uh, the river scene with the girls. Um, so that's okay. I mean, we're just gonna we're just sketching and exploring right now. I hadn't intended to get into blood flower, but you know, go with the flow, right?
kind of thinking if her hair was pulled taut so tight that it's receding in the front. Do a new one. Just keep it flowing. Hmm. See what other kind of reference we can find here. Keep it going. Whenever I'm looking through reference for faces in particular, I'm not I'm usually never really that interested in beauty. I'm actually more interested in finding things that are more... I'll pull this over here so you guys can see it for a little bit. I'm interested in finding things that are a little bit more... Um, like there's interesting lighting or interesting expressions. And the problem is that the majority of the time when you've got uh, collections like these, they're just mo model focused. So I'm actually looking for interesting looking people interesting features um i don't know cool just cool elements it's a really really great portrait oh there's something let's play with that let me get that out of the way so you guys can see me paint looks like i already kind of got started on him that way let's do a bigger one It's tough because he's got dark, dark uh, skin, like pretty olivey looking skin, and he's in a in a equal. He's equally lit from both sides, so the dark is in the center. It seems like, you know, when you're starting out that that you're just kind of pooping shapes out. It's it's no painting really starts real sexy. But you're putting the shapes down specifically as kind of like little markers. You're making little anchor points and you know, they can all be edited. It's just about getting the getting the overall map of the thing sorted out. Once you've got the map, it's so much easier to start filling in all the little masses, but you have to have your, your points of reference first. I love painting portraits. 
it's kind of like cheating in a way because with portraits, I mean, it's a minimal amount of effort and you get all of the, you get all of the glory. <laughs> People like faces, you know, we're kind of just, we're built for it by design. I'm unifying, I'm building the keys in the individual areas so that the, the masses themselves are already keyed. And then I can just kind of, you know, pick and pick and, and push the lights and darks within that key in order to create the details that I want. And because the key will already, already be sorted, um, the job is much, much easier. Go ahead and grab a new brush. Let's see, what about this guy? So now that I have kind of my anchor points, then it's about kind of just grabbing, you know, f fixing the in-between areas of the anchor points and making sure that everything kind of feels accurate to my reference. At what point of painting do you der do wait what at what point of a painting do you derive from when you say derive do you mean like like move away from deviate like making it different I do like to think about, you know, it, and, and this is true for all of my illustrations and, and concept art. Like, I try to make big decisions, big bold decisions early on, so that even if I was, if even if I was to take this and leave it as it is now, and just walk away and say this is finished, that it's legible and there's something there, there's something meaty to hold on to. Yes. At what point do I start making stylization decisions? Oh, I see. I'm making them for pretty much from the beginning. When I'm when you're doing that anchoring, you're unless you're you know practicing a very specific style of of representational art, you're already stylizing because you're not matching it 100%. Um, so I did things like you know making the hair much more bouffanty and big. Um, I made the face a little bit longer than what he's got. I'm changing bits of anatomy here and there to make them. I don't know pleasing in, in the arrangement that I have them with the brushes that I have available. So much of what's happening is the result of the, the stylization that you're talking about is the result of the decisions that you're making as you go. So it kind of happens on its own. You don't need to worry about it too much. So for instance, like there, I'm, I'm, I'm working with a squarish brush. So my options are very limited for the kind of sh shapes I can make. And by, by forcing myself into those parameters, then, you know, a stylization decisions need to be made. I think that's one of the reasons that, you know, traditional painting especially really chunky traditional painting can look so cool is because uh, you're having to make do with what you got, you know?
Do I use any grid or sight drawing techniques to match reference? Um, I learned how to do that. I've never really liked it because I like the inherent stylization that comes from the, uh, the inaccuracies, if that makes sense. I like, I like it when it's not exactly right. I don't like super representational stuff, personally. It's not, it's not a statement on how painting should be at all. Everybody has their different tastes. Um, the grid stuff, you know, I learned it. Um, it's just, it was really boring to me. I like, I like making crazy stuff. Even, you know, even when I was in classes doing painting from life with models and things like that, I never, I never painted the model. I always turned them into monsters. <laughs> Part of that might just be that I just don't paint. I, I'm not really good at likeness. I prefer to capture, if I can, like a feeling rather than and it, making something exactly right. Again, it's just different ways of doing the same thing. I always tend to over push the brow. I don't know why. I mean, it's because I have such a pronounced one myself. I love painting in black and white, it's so much easier. <laughs> this guy with his little smolder to be looking at us. So I'm going way off reference here, completely changing the direction of his eyes. Yeah. Got a little bit of kind of a Gary Oldman thing. Young Gary Oldman. Kind of hot, kind of creepy, kind of hot. Might stab you in the face. You don't know. You just don't know. That's the appeal, right? <laughs> Got that Mexican brow.
I did kind of see in his skin. So this is gonna require smoothing his skin just a touch because I did see, even though the, the model's skin is flawless, the way the photo looks, I saw kind of like a pock marking, which I thought actually added character to him so he doesn't feel so perfect. And as I mentioned, you know, at the very beginning, it's I like I like figures and characters that just have some interest, some visual interest to paint. One of the things you have to think about when you're changing eye the eye direction is you have to change the shape because the 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 eyeball itself is not a pure sphere. Where the cornea is, it changes the it's it's like a little sphere on top of a sphere, so it gives it a little bit of a, a hump. And when you uh, when you rotate your eye around, that little hump changes the contours of the eyelid ever so slightly, but it's enough that uh, it can if you don't. Uh, change the shape of the eyelid to match where the cornea is located. It will f it will feel a little bit off That is not what I intended to do We want to quickly and easily smooth transitions. Nothing beats the smudge brush. Cheating. We are such cheater pants in this room. And now he's got definitely more of a Val Kilmer vibe, I think. Real genius Val Kilmer. Or maybe a, a better, uh, in better health, Doc Holliday. <laughs> Do you prefer the monsters over the over normal people? <laughs> You, you do? Yeah. Well, there's always time for monsters. Sometimes we just gotta practice. All right, so what I wanted to hint at was sort of heavy pockmarking, kind of Edward James Olmos cheeks and jaw. Surprisingly easy to do because all you're doing is making little craters, right? You're you need a little place of shadow and then you need a little a little rim highlight where the lights picked up. We can't forget our 
highlights in the hair. A few of those little tertiary details in there, because why not? Let's um, get these ears a little bit more accurate to the face. Just using the, abra the eraser rather than actually painting now. Since it's all on one layer, you can kind of get away with some little bit of creative cheese in it. Soften that up. Of course, the lightest light on this figure is the same value as the background, so. Good enough for now. Get him out of the way. Let's see what's next. I like this one. Get another text, get back to that texture brush right there. If you're feeling like not doing like the, the, the full shapiness that I like to do, that's fine. You can do lines and just do them with a bigger brush. So you can get, you know, draw basically the shapes you're after. The important thing is just getting it in quickly so you're not noodling. You don't want to noodle in, in, the, in the anchoring stage when you're first mapping out your uh, your figure or your portrait.
And just like the other ones, when you're first starting out the sketch, it's never going to look really hot. It's always kind of just a lumpy, shitty mess. I say just lean into it, let it happen. I imagine almost everybody in here is international because everybody here is all in uh, on vacations and stuff for the holiday. They out there spreading that COVID. Yeah, you gotta party it up. You're in Spain, right, Chris? You see, I think you mentioned that before. I love Spain. Food is fantastic. Oh, South Texas. Okay, my bad. I've never been out that way. I've only been to Dallas, actually. Nothing like uh, Austin, Corpus Christi, or anything like that. <laughs> Food's good. You got the barbecue, my friend. The weirdest thing that I found about Dallas was just how flat it was. I grew up on the West Coast, so 
Like I'm used to mountains and valleys and all kinds of crazy stuff. I, I, being able to see like the next town over just by water towers, I'd never seen nothing like that before. That was crazy cakes. <laughs> it's the flatness for sure. I'm trying to create the effect of like little twists and dreads with like just the brush. like what we've done with the trees in the past like just making it capture the big shape the 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 overall feel and then it's all about playing with the contours and getting little little dangly bits in there let's go ahead and blend some of this back I think I'm going to unify all this value here on this side and just go darker. Darker than I have with the other paints because the other sketches, these, this is the darkest dark that I used, I think. Yeah. So in this case, I want that value key on the dark side to have its own uh, accent values. Or we could let the shadow kind of fade away. I don't know, I like the idea of accent values actually, so I take it back. Don't listen to my lying poor mouth.
It's weird. I, I always tend to add the eyebrows last, and it's almost always the thing that kind of finally makes it look like a face. <laughs> I don't know. It's weird. Finish out this sketch. Let's wrap her up, put her to the side here. Yeah, I got caught in a tornado in Oklahoma when I was a kid. Well, we were chased by one. Not a fan. Tornadoes suck ass. Everybody's so pretty. Stop being so pretty. Let's do a profile. We haven't done a profile really yet. I already have a new layer. I'm gonna go straight into caricature. Because these figures are just too good looking. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta make them fun. I don't know why everybody in these photos is doing this. Weird as hell.
how do I pronounce my last name? No, it's like the, it's a short, uh, it's a short R. Medrano. Medrano. No, rrr. It's not an R, it's an R. So I'm just switching back and forth between an eraser and, and the, the brush in order to get these these values in. In a way, I'm kind of doing an inverse, like I'm I'm painting back so that you can see the line. So instead of actually just doing the line drawing to start, I'm, I'm painting in the values. His eyebrows are fucking ridiculous. <laughs> Definitely got kind of more an aquiline nose, so I'm going to accentuate that even harder. Just to make it more damn interesting to look at. really weird this guy doesn't have very much planes on the face some of that's definitely the the lighting scenario that the, uh, the photographer did but so weird They always have that just that confused mouth. Like they just swallowed a fly. Just, just about to start drooling. <laughs> I guess it's kind of the face I make when I'm painting, so I can't make too much fun of them. <laughs> I've watched the videos, I know what I look like. Shut up. It's like this. It's very upsetting. <laughs> You see it all the time. Just give a scroll through through Tinder. You will see some of this, guaranteed.
Like, here it goes. Guys. <laughs> yeah. Well, the problem is I got to get more subscribers. Uh, I, I've already unlocked all the maximum emotes available. I, what's crazy is, so like, oh, you're going to love this. So when I first started, when I first got the um, got affiliate, uh, I was told, you, you know, you got to make all these personalized emotes and shit. So I spent an entire day going through all of my art and, and through a bunch of silly stuff and just made all these different emotes. And uh, I sized them and I did all of the legwork to get them ready to go. And then I went to go and, and upload them and I'm only allowed three. So I did, I think I did 30. <laughs> I did 30 emotes. I only have three. It hurt my heart. But they're done already, so should the day ever come that I get me some more subscribers and followers and unlock the next level, then I can put up some more. Because there's some really funny shit in there, some silly, awful shit too. Because, you know, it's me. It's what I do. Emotes for the Discord. I'll have to look up. I didn't, I didn't even know that was something I could do. I'll look up to see if I can do them there. I love this slack-jawed look. I like uh, painting ears from models because it's you end up you always end up kind of just doing a symbol for the ear shape, right? You know, because they're all so similar and nobody really looks at them, so you can kind of get away with cutting corners on ears. But when you're painting from a model, you really got to pay attention and try to at least capture roughly the shape, you know. Of course, I keep making them too big, so there's that. <laughs> oh, this shit's absurd. <laughs> yeah, basically.
Throw in those quick accent values just for fun. Round out this sketch. I just like that sort of lost confusion look. <laughs> We should just give him lip gloss, because that shit's funny. His front hair is somewhere between tentacles and horns. I'm sticking with it. All the more reason to keep him. <laughs> Let's just fill up this page today and we'll call it a good study session. Spend some time together. It might be interesting to go a different route and do a really pale person and go the opposite direction, go light. How did my interview go? It went really great. Um, I think, you know, they're, the, the company's really interested. The, the creative director, um, he actually watched some of my Twitch stuff and he watched uh, some YouTube things and, and went through my art station. He seemed pretty pleased with... Um, you know, both the teaching and the 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 art style and, and having sort of an aesthetic. So, I mean, it looks it sounds pretty promising. It, it could be it could be the next gig for for at least some time, which is fine with me because it kind of, it will it will present the kind of challenge that I'm looking for right now, which is, you know, a little a little bit more leadership. Um, guiding guiding the aesthetic of, of a product you know art direction basically i'm just i'm really into doing that right now oh this guy looks fantastic this is the guy i'm sure i've seen him before too oh <laughs> i am going to be painting a portrait of nat king cole <laughs> i knew i recognized him i'm a dum-dum 
All right, new layer. Maybe I can... This guy needs to get out of the way for Nat. One good way to, to kind of approach looking at the when you're when you're trying to figure out your anchor points for mapping things out is to uh, pick a side, start figuring out some of the contours, and then do the direct opposite side, and just do this tagging back and forth, back and forth from one side to the to the other side, and making sure that those relationships feel correct to whatever your reference is. Easier said than done, but it helps. Like I said, first you just got to get something down. You 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 got to be willing to be wrong, horribly wrong. And then just get going. This is such a great portrait. Holy shit. Beautiful. I like to get in the 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 brow ridge and the well rather the bridge right up here on the nose this uh keystone is that's my number one if i can get that in and get it to f to fit in the right spot after i've anchored everything else out i can i always feel like i can get it get the rest of the likeness from there this guy's got an amazing skull and his ears are so far back it's, it's such an interesting look And they're tiny ears. While I'm mapping out my the likeness and doing the, the line drawing of things, I like to get the values into. And it's it's just a two birds with one stone kind of deal. This is such a dark portrait. So that means he's gotta be very dark. smoking a cheroot or something like that which is creating his skin is dark and and the way he's lit the smoke is creating a little tendril that's going up through the dark shadows in his face and it just looks cool as shit this guy's just cool man Carve out the dark shapes. What's good? What I, I'm comfortable doing these kind of carved, almost line line drawing elements because I know that I'm going to have to go back over this with so much dark, like uh, full shapes that have dark dark value. So a lot of this is going to get buried again, but I can I can kind of make a point of pulling it out. Because I know that the, these will be my darkest darks. They'll be my my uh, my accent values. I'm 
And then I'm just gonna go back in and darken that. Going from going straight into value can be really tough because it really forces you to ignore line work and just start making really big decisions with your value. Do I like to have a lot of variety in my value or do I keep it limited? Um, I start limited and then start pushing it from there. Um, I think it's, in a lot of ways, it's easier to design the overall image that you're making so long as you have a value key in mind uh, than it is to try and bring, bring a value key back in. Now that said, it's it's pretty easy to, especially with digital, to do sort of atmosphere and knock, you know, knock a key back using things like screen layers and things like that. But if you don't know what you're doing, the chances for making something look really spotty instead of keyed is high. It's very easy to do. It requires a lot of thought and planning ahead of time and, and that's especially if you're what you're trying to do is to capture things like getting getting strokes getting overlay having that fresh feel so that it doesn't it doesn't feel like way overly rendered If you have the other aspect to that is is the the value key everything that's in the greater value key of your lighting situation of the entire canvas has to it everything in it has to live within that key and so then every sub key that you have meaning you know the key for you know Nat's skin in particular or the key for his uh, cheroot here is it's it has to live within that greater key. And it's easier to map that out from the beginning than it is to try and fix that at the end. You'll know where to put in put in your, your effort for rendering. You don't wanna spend a lot of time rendering on something that, that's not really gonna be seen.
Let's see if this accent value for him. Nope. But we will go even darker. It's such an interesting epicanthic eye fold here. It's a very heavy fold over the eyelid, which creates this this big. It, it's like a mound of. I kind of have it too. It's this mound of fat that kind of built, bulges out as the eyelid is open, and uh, it it kills a lot of. You can't quite see the details of the eyelid because that fold is so thick and there's so much skin there. And it's, it's a difficult feature to paint and get to feel accurate. Because it can, it can make the eyes so cartoony. He has a really tiny nose. I've, I've much overdone his nose now that I'm looking at it. The mouth and the rest is pretty close, but the nose I've actually been a little too generous with. tough because because he's an actual historical figure you know rather than just a rando model you, you got to kind of you gotta try to get, you gotta try to get the likeness a little better and it's a good challenge sometimes to try because as I said it's a weakness of mine Interesting face he's got. So here I'm having to deal with the the mass of the flesh. There's there's this this bunching of the flesh because this the cigarette holder is is occupying that space. And you have to be mindful of the of the flesh itself. You have to follow the logic of it as you round out that form. Easier said than done.
That is such an interesting nose. I often think about stuff like that, like looking at the anatomy of people that are exceptional at, at like singing, for instance, right? How their skull shape might be different and, and as a result make the resonance better when they when they sing. Or those people that can do really crazy things with their tongues. Like are they are they better whistlers? <laughs> it's an interesting thought. using that darker value now just to carve out the shapes it, it's no longer just an accent value because so much of the so much of the the um, portrait is in silhouette almost of in darkness it's like a chiaroscuro almost there's there's a little bit of bounce and reflected light but not much and a lot of that is post-processing in the photo which is something you have to kind of worry about when you're working from photos can make painting from photos very difficult. If you don't know um, why certain values are crunching, you'll follow it and you'll, you'll, you'll be doing it accurately, but it, it won't feel right because the behavior doesn't translate very well. Remember another pitfall of drawing from photos or distortion of form due to the camera lens? Absolutely. Uh, wide angle lenses will distort the shit out of. In fact, this girl here is was photographed with a wide angle lens, so her ears are not visible. Um, this one's a, 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 a more distant lens or a longer lens. So the if, if it's a smaller, more like, you know, consumer level uh, camera, you're not going to get you, you kind of end up with a face that looks a little bit bigger as a result. And yeah, you absolutely have to think about that. If you're trying to do something as an illustration, it, it can change significantly. I have a relatively recent lesson, actually. I, think it, I don't even think I've released it on Gumroad yet, but for my patrons, I cover um, how to use the camera, use, using different camera lenses for narrative effect in your illustration. I'll have to get that up, I've actually forgotten to post it. I'm a little bit behind on my gum road. I'll be sure to let you all know when it's, when that stuff is live though.
his skin is dark, his shirt is dark, and the the photo is in a very harsh um, sepia tone, which gives it a nice dated look. And, and we're obviously losing that, but that's okay. So now I've, I've done the, the chiaroscuro of the shadow side. I do have to kind of bring back some of the lights there because there is a little bit. And like introducing any, with any painting, introducing more than one light source is going to round out your, your figure. So by introducing this light source, it's gonna give him some, some three dimensionality and a little bit of depth, which is nice, that's what we want. Interesting looking cat. So this is the fill light. I've, I've introduced it on the forehead, but I really didn't put it in the rest of the face. So I have to now start kind of introducing that light and its effect throughout the face. It's interesting, it's just such a slight change in value that's showing the, the top side forms of like the masses of his cheek, the anatomy of the, the masseter and stuff like that. It's just really, really subtle. The value difference is, it's less than 5%. So it's, this is what I'm talking about with that value control thing. It's, it's really vital.
I'm choosing to, it's a little bit brighter there, but I'm choosing to kind of unify the values in order to uh, draw more attention to the eyes. I'm letting, you know, the values kind of play lost and found. Make a new layer, go underneath. And the, the background for him is actually not, it's not that dark at all, but I wanted to kind of create this little opportunity for not, not necessarily a rim light, but almost kind of a halo effect, just a, a slight glow. It's a it's a portrait painter's technique to kind of it just gives this this ethereal sort of that's the word I'm looking for just a, it's it's a bit of an over the top technique it's like the idea you know another portrait painter technique is to is to paint the hair a little bit bigger than life and this is another way that you can kind of create other a little bit more subtlety to the character rounding out the form implying a rim light with without implying one it's it's very suggestive and you can so for example you know there, there's places where i'm kind of creating a rim light or creating a little sort of haze effect that's around him and then there's other places where i can actually unify the value of the background. Let's say, let's say I don't want to draw attention to the, the contours of the mouth and the nose. Well, then I can take the the value and push it right up against it. And then the fact that there that there's this, there's less of a line there gives it a little bit more lost and found effect. It's a it's a, a sort of a backwards way to to perform edge control. So like, let's say here, I would like that shoulder to just get lost in the background. That that edge doesn't need to be there. It can kind of melt away. Well, then I can play with the edge and soften it significantly. Same thing here. See how it just kind of like, the contours there don't really matter anymore. It's the same idea. I think he deserves even slightly deeper accent values since this is going to be sort of our finishing move tonight. Just a couple of degrees darker. Oh, I got to be on the top layer, otherwise we won't see it. I'm painting lightly with this dark. And then making a sharp edge here in the hair because his 
this photo, it's really made a point of that, of the silhouette of his head. And so I want to kind of follow that effect and really give a nice strong contour there. His hair is heavily pomaded. Salty watermelon. Welcome. Why not use flow to blend stuff? Flow. When you're talking about flow, do you mean liquefy? I don't use liquefy because it's it's slower. Uh, it tends to be a little bit more beastly on the processor, and uh, you don't have brushes. You only have you only have a simple round to do your your smudge. In essence, while strong, you can get you can get everything that's on a layer pretty easily. It uh, it takes away a lot of control. Pushing the eyes even further with another accent value. All right, I think that's a good stopping point for just a study day. It was nice fun hanging out and doing some sketching. Hopefully you all enjoyed yourselves. Yeah, there we go. Nat's done. How's that? Got a couple of hours in on a holiday. Thank you all for taking the time to join. Hopefully you all pick some good stuff up. Yeah, it was good. You know, good practice. Good to put a little time in and, you know, work on the fundamentals. So, 
take the time, level up when you can. Anyway, hope you all enjoyed yourselves. We'll see you next time. Until then, paint smart, paint sexy. I'm Izzy, a professional writer, concept artist, and illustrator. I've taught painting for a dozen years or so on and offline. Many of your favorite illustrators and designers have studied with me or under me and have gone on to teach in their own right. You're here because, like they did, you want to learn to paint realistically for illustration or concept art. Well, worry not. You're in the right place. Grab a seat. I want you to join me as I explain all the aspects of image making in extremely digestible and clear monthly lessons. Not through the lens of silly how to paint hair or eye demos. That shit is carnival tricks. And you're not really learning anything except an exact way to render one thing in one manner. This is painting mysticism at its worst. Watching these kinds of exploitative lessons won't help you level up with your understanding. Sure, now you can paint sparkly hair, but what if you want to paint a dragon, or figure out how to render a sea of fire, or depict a one-eyed transgender space marine dying in the vacuum of space? Painting and image making are tools of communication, and can be learned by anyone willing to put in some time. Light grammar is for language. Light, color, and form literally follow a formula. Painting well is not a matter of chicken bones, zombie crackers, and the ever-dismissive concept of talent. Learning with my series, Izzy's Logic of Light and Color, will give you the tools and understanding so you can analyze light and form in reality and bring it to life in your work. Using this simple system I have distilled will help you harness your art to share your ideas as you've always intended. When we are children, we all draw in symbols. Symbols for our house, our hands, the sun, the grass, our pet lobster. As we grow into artists, we must learn to throw away symbols and begin to draw and paint what it is we actually see. And as we grow further, we learn to paint beyond what we see and what is actually there. Until finally we move beyond this and learn to trim away what is actually there so we voice only what we want. With me, you're going to have to buckle in and maybe take some pain meds. Because I'm going to rip out your normal person's eyes and replace them with a painter's eyes. I'm going to restructure how you see and how you understand what you're seeing. I'm going to turn you into a painting machine. Truly, anyone can learn to paint realistically if they can both determine what they're seeing or imagining with basic and straightforward rules. Once you understand the mechanics of light, color, and form, in reality, you will have the capacity to paint anything you can see or imagine realistically. After that, the real fun begins. Here are some of the ways you can join me and master the logic of light and color. The very first lesson of my series is totally free on my YouTube channel. In that lesson, I give you the three primary rules of light that are the very foundation of painting and understanding light itself. If you do nothing else to make your painting mastery easier, at least watch this amazing little lesson. It will do more for your basic understanding of light than just about any tutorial you can find. When you're ready to get deeper and you feel like you have those first rules figured out, allow me to utterly blow your mind with the next episodes available on Gumroad and ArtStation. As we go deeper into the rules underlying the logic of light and color, I carefully and simply explain important and interesting elements. From beginner to pro, there is an amazing amount of information available. Each concept has been distilled into the clearest explanation you're likely to find anywhere. Like episode two, where we cover the atmospheric effect and how that relates to light, scale, and distance of objects in reality, and how to render it. Or episode three, where I hand over the ultimate key to controlling value in your paintings. Episodes 5 through 8 are all about rendering materials. Want to understand the logic behind rendering metal, leather, hair, transparency, damn near anything. I even cover the logic behind painting special effects like fire, neon, or lightsabers in later episodes. The lessons just get deeper and more detailed as I build on the foundations covered in preceding episodes. The tenth gives you the most important rule of composition you'll ever learn to keep your images interesting. 
The next few episodes cover important painting techniques like my edge control ninjutsu or simplification with the large to small system. We dip a toe in color theory, devote a few episodes to finishing full-blown illustrations utilizing the techniques we've learned so far. Some episodes, like the lighting game or advanced exercises one, the shirt, present cheap, valuable, and practical exercises to give you explosive growth in your development. Episodes 22 through 25 cover painting and illustration, just like I do for Magic the Gathering, from assignment and inception to signing the painting at the end. Each one is full of tips, knowledge, everything to make working as an illustrator easier. Did you enjoy learning how to paint basic materials? Metal, wood, and such? I got three whole episodes devoted to the intricate logic behind painting different kinds of skin. After that, more lessons devoted to pumping life into your portraits and original methods for accurately drawing faces out of your head. From fundamentals to photo bashing, Gumroad and ArtStation have every lesson I create available for purchase a la carte. But here's an even better way to learn with me. Stay current with my latest lessons on Patreon for the lowest price available. Monthly support gets my student that month's lesson, a critique or paint over of their finished work, a discount code for 25% off the entire Gumroad archive, and access to the Logic of Light and Color Discord community, where we plan future lessons, share knowledge, and learn together as a team. The absolute best method is to join my Patreon classroom at the Student Plus tier, where you'll get everything I just mentioned and a free episode from the archive every month to accelerate your mastery at your own pace. You've decided to take control of your painting and master Izzy's logic of light and color. Now it's up to you to choose the path that's best for you. I'll see you on the flip side. Paint smart, paint sexy.